Good morning. Um, instead of doing straight lecture during class, I'm going to try doing it this way. Call up my uh, my teacher romance with Mr. Betts inspiring me. I don't know. Um, to start with, I've got a little Sunday morning music for listeners out there. Um, we'll talk about this in just a second. Okay, so that's kind of, um, you think Wade for that little bit of inspiration right there. Um, that song really kind of sums up a lot of what we're going to talk about with industrialization and unions. Um, the concept of working, uh, feeling disconnected from the society, and most importantly, the concept of owing the company store, um, which is something that was very common um, in these factory systems in these factory towns they were even common into the 20th century um, I, I don't think now in 2015 we fully appreciate the degree to which some communities relied on a specific industry and that that specific industry dominated everything um, our society is largely the product of the 1970s and the end of that system and so we it's not familiar to us but that's how things were done for about a hundred years um, do you see the trend it takes us a hundred years to change anything um, so it's kind of fascinating when, when we start looking at this so let's get started looking at industrialization and I'm gonna try to go quickly so that I don't you know make this incredibly boring um, if it will eventually load I'm probably asking my computer. My heat's not on in my room, so the computer's probably complaining. Um, all right, industrialization. A lot of this slide is stuff that we've already talked about um, that has to do with those fundamentals, those elements, those components of industrialization that you need to be aware of, you need to understand. Um, so that should really kind of go back to what we've already talked about. The key things I want you to point to, point to or see is going to be this idea of we all get rich, um, and that the profit motive is what's dominating. Um, and for a lot of these industries, the profit motive is the thing. And the workers are just a component. They're just part of that economies of scale. 
And so their workers are not being viewed as human beings. Um, and, you know, it becomes very difficult when we start looking at these working conditions and we think about the strikes and that kind of thing. It's tempting to want to judge uh, the industries. And, you know, I'm, I'm predisposed to judging corporations. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, but at the same time, that profit motive, that desire to get rich, it is not inherently bad. Um, it's no different than you wanting to be at the top of your class or you wanting to be the best basketball or football player or the best singer or whatever. Um, the desire to be the best is not a bad thing. Um, and so in a lot of ways, that's what the profit motive was, was the desire to be the best, at, you know, and does it translate into wealth? Absolutely. Um, the problem is that for a lot of these industries, a lot of these robber barons, captains of industries, people, um, the, the workers that ran their industry, that, that you know, dug the coal, that processed the steel, that sewed the clothes, these people were just a part of the overall profit. And I think that's where we can be judgmental if we can. Um, so keep that in mind. And then understand this concept of extra workers. Um, a whole part, a whole big component to the unions and their struggle is the fact that the United States was a magnet for people um, from all over the world. And to some extent, we still are. Um, and so consequently, there's always a labor pool. There's always somebody looking for a job. Um, so if you're talking about a union that's trying to make a point, it becomes very difficult for them because there's always somebody willing to come in and fill in. Uh, a couple of pictures shows you the the happy life of an industrial worker in the Gilded Age. Uh, lots of smoke, lots of dirt, all that kind of stuff. Um, some more about railroads. We've kind of talked about this already uh, with the increased management and standardization. Uh, standardization and consolidation starts with the railroads and the time zones and controlling transportation, but it doesn't take very long before, remember, efficiency is the name of the game, and efficiency will spread to every component of, of industry right, from time clocks to how long is your break and all that kind of stuff. Uh, rebates, you need to be sure you have kind of a grasp of the rebate system simply because um, it's the rebates that are going to help trigger the rise of the populist party. And when we talk about politics of the Gilded Age, understanding the populace, how they formed, how they influenced the other two parties, um, and, and what reforms they were striving for, is going to be very important. And it's the rebate system that, in, that causes the populace to be created. Um, they are the um, seminal kind of start of that. Um, so we've got rate and price wars, destroying smaller railroads. Um, and what that will do is limit job opportunities because as consolidation destroys competition, as a worker or as a consumer, what are your options? And so that's the main component there. Um, government funding to private investment, um, just kind of understand, sorry, yawn, um, just kind of understand that, that this concept of laissez-faire is not, um, <laughs> it, it's not as authentic as, as the robber barons wanted to believe it was. Men like Rockefeller wanted to say, well, hey, you know, laissez-faire, the government didn't help me at all. Well, but yeah, no. That's not the case. And so understand, and this is true even today when people talk about the role of government uh, in the economy or the role of government and how it limits or helps or whatever hinders uh, business growth. Um, all businesses in the United States benefit from the infrastructure. All businesses in the United States benefit from the educational system. All businesses in the United States benefit from, uh, you know, tariffs and import controls, those things help everybody. And so to sit there and say, well, the government didn't help me at all, eh, well, that's a bit much. You can't quite say the government didn't help you at all. Now, you might feel like the government didn't help you very much, and certainly the government doesn't have the gumption to go out and make something happen. And let's not take away from the individual the importance of that, because that's very true. Uh, but the government is does provide some foundational structures that allow business to succeed. Um, this is one of, you know, for me personally, in my personal opinion, um, one of the reasons why, you know, I, I'm a huge advocate for infrastructure spending. I'm a huge advocate for education. I mean, um, 
And I would even argue that health care, not, not health care as it exists with the Affordable Care Act, because I think that's got some problems to it, but I think health care is, is an infrastructure thing. Um, all of these things make smart workers, good workers, facilitate transportation, and I don't care what size your business is, whether you're a small business or a corporation, all of that's going to be good for your bottom line. Um, it's just, it gets kind of, you know, the, the problem is, you know, how is it going to, how is raising taxes going to affect one industry? How is, you know, lowering tariffs going to affect another? I mean, you've got lots of, you know, you know delicate nuances um, that make this a complicated issue. Um, and so I think that what you see when you're talking about this transition from, uh, or this question about laissez-faire, whether you're talking about the Gilded Age or 2015, is really a wrestling with the question of, you know, how do we how do we utilize government in a way that encourages free enterprise, and yet treats everybody fairly, and and it's a, and it's an imperfect process. It will never get it down just right, um, and so that's you know, so I'll put up my soapbox now. Um, but I think that it's just important for you to kind of grasp that, even you know, regardless of how your personal feelings are about the role of government in industry. I think that having a, a grasp for how these components fit together will help you understand not only the Gilded Age and the rise of unions and the rise of populists, but will help you understand you know, modern political issues as well. Uh, we've already talked about this. Integration, horizontal or vertical, ultimately creates a difficult environment for the workers. Um, if you're talking horizontal integration where you limit competition, you're talking about fewer employers. There's fewer options. If, you know, if Standard Oil has eaten up all the oil refineries in your town, you've got one employer to go to if you work in the oil, in the oil refineries. Um, you have no option. If, you're, if it's a vertical industry, you might have other options, but the reality is that the company that's most vertically integrated is going to be the most successful, the most secure. You could go to another company, but they're going to be a less secure employment. And if and for the, the gorilla on the block, right, the, the Brahms ice cream company, or in the case of Carnegie, U.S. Steel, um, while there may be other job opportunities out there, um, they're still going to, because they are so lean and mean and good at what they do because of the job security, they're going to be able to ask more of their workers. They're going to be able to say, your workers need to put out. Um, you need to, you know, we're going to, we have to cut your wages back because, well, you know, we're vertically integrated and um, times are tough and so that's just how it's going to be. Sure, there's other places you can go work, but they're more vulnerable to the market because they don't have a system in place. So um, just remember that integration limits opportunities for everybody. A um, couple of key ideas, and I touched on this uh, the other day in lecture. Um, you have Ideas about how society responds to industrialization. Uh, Gospel of Wealth by Andrew Carnegie. This is the concept of American individualism and success, that even the wealthy should not just pass their wealth down to their kids, that it helps everybody if you have to make it on your own. And you certainly see this, uh, who was it? I think it was Sting was commenting that he's going to limit how much money his children inherit. Um, certainly Bill Gates seems to be of that mindset that at some point just passing down wealth to your children is irrelevant. Um, of course, if you're the child, you may feel a little differently. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, typically the idea is that having to work hard for something is good for you. It's good for the American character. Um, and I certainly think that this is a strong theme within kind of the American mythology, the American mindset, um, that being an individual that works hard, that's able to be successful, you should be rewarded for that. Um, and so this is where, you know, this is part of what unions are saying is that, well, it doesn't matter how hard we work, we can never get ahead. And so this is one of the other questions that kind of filters in the back of the American psyche. How do we resolve that? How do we take individuals that are willing to work really, really hard, but they never get ahead? What, what forces are at play? Um, for those of you in my sociology class, this is the sociological imagination, right? The concept that there's a greater societal... Um, system that sometimes limits people's opportunities in ways that perhaps are not very obvious. Um, and so just kind of understand that while the gospel of wealth is a very prevailing idea, um, and it certainly is very American, 
Um, and, and I don't know that it's wrong. It's an, it, there's an absolute truth to it. However, just keep in mind that, um, that you are looking at, at a lot of other nuances there. Um, social Darwinism, survival of the fittest in corporations and society. Again, my so sociology people, um, y'all would recognize this. Um, we talked about that with Rockefeller, that if you can't make it, then, well, I guess you just need to, you know, <laughs> clearly you can't adapt, so you, you must die, um, which sounds very harsh, and it is harsh. Um, and a lot of the progressive reforms we'll talk about later are a reaction against that mindset, a reaction saying that, you know what, that's not the American way. Our American way is not to devour the weak. Um, and certainly your, your Rockefellers, your Gordon Geckos, those kind of people are not going to agree with that. Um, but I do think that, and I think by and large Americans or American society as a general kind of concept doesn't like this approach. Um, you do have some that are more radical that argue wealth redistribution where you tax the rich. Um, this is where it gets kind of dicey, especially, you know, in, in modern politics, looking at Obama and his uh, claims to help the middle class. Um, you know, and, and I don't know. And wealth redistribution has on its surface kind of a taint of radicalism. Um, but I think the question is, how are you redistributing the wealth? And we'll see throughout, really from the Gilded Age all the way into modern times, there's various spots where we do ask this question of, okay, maybe the people that are doing the best, that, you know, that 1% or whatever, that top of the, you know, the really wealthy individuals that have benefited from this American system, maybe it wouldn't hurt for them to pay a little more you know, they're still going to have tons of money, so why can't they pay a slightly higher percentage? Um, and I don't know that that's un-American. I think that it's, you know, it gets, it's a very emotional kind of position to take, and I think there's people that really buy into the gospel of wealth concept, the American individualism, um, that really take offense at the idea of redistribution. Um, and there can, but just understand that when we talk about those concepts, there's a huge range from you're talking modest tax reform to, you know, full on communism. So just because we mention wealth redistribution, whether you're talking about reconstruction and, you know, how can we truly help the, the former slaves? I mean, and the suggestion that was made that the only way to really help is to change their economic circumstances. If you're looking at that, if you're looking at Huey Long's Share the Wealth program, um, if you're talking about uh, LBJ's War on Poverty, whatever it is you're talking about, or Obama's, you know, kind of vague and nonspecific, you know, promise to help the middle class, it doesn't have to mean that we that we're embracing communism. Um, it does mean that we're that we're looking at the overall system and we're asking some hard questions of it. Um, so this was begun because of the Gilded Age, because of the extreme difference between the wealthy and the poor. Um, government management, um, this is what progressivism is all about. So giving you kind of a heads up of what to expect when we talk about progressivism. Progressivism is government management. That, <clears throat> that the government is a good thing, the government's a friend, and it can help manage stuff. Obviously there's people that don't feel that way. Um, and that can be valid. Uh, that's not necessarily wrong. There's certainly plenty of examples where the government screws it up. Um, but it is, this is a response to the Gilded Age. Um, so all these political mindsets that we still talk about in 2015 began because of the circumstances around industrialization. So when I pointed out that, that the world that we know really begins after the Civil War, this is what I'm talking about. Um, socialism, uh, this is, you know, much more when we're talking about government management. Um, socialism is kind of a variation, a, a, a difference of that. It's different than the American form of, you know, let's examine the tax code or, you know, let's manage and set some regulations down so we preserve competition. That would be very much the American response. Socialism is going to say the government's going to step in and own a portion of certain industries. And so, I mean, the best example I can think of would be um, if the government stepped in and said, we're going to own all electric companies, that electricity is going to be a, a government-managed thing. Well, what that would do, essentially, is remove electricity from the marketplace. So you're not going to have Matthew McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey trying to convince us to buy Reliant Energy. We're not going to have... Um, 
you know, TXU running ads. Um, and so consumers would not have options. They would, would, ha they would have one option. Um, it's kind of similar to, um, you know, I live in Garland. Um, Garland utilities are Garland utilities, and you have one choice. You don't get to go shop around. Um, so just, just to use it as an example, that we have degrees of that even now today in the United States. Um, it's going to depend on your community. I think that's the difference with, with Americans is that rather than having, say, in Great Britain or France where you've got a strong national socialism, um, and don't confuse that with the national socialists that become the Nazis, for those of you that are reading ahead in Larson's book, but countries like Great Britain and France that, that rely on true socialism, where they take key industries and the government really controls them. In the case of you know, Great Britain, they control health care, for instance. Um, in the United States, we often diffuse that so it's not a federal control, the control of the United States government, but a state or local control. So like I said, in the case of Garland, Garland is able to say, okay, you can only come to Garland Utilities. You can't go shop around to Reliant. I don't have that option because that's how Garland rolls, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's fine, whatever, just so I get my lights on, right? Um, so you, you're going to have variations. School systems are an example of that. Education is, is a service that for a long time was private, was done in the home, or people sent their kids to private schools. You would have the, the occasional isolated com community, like up in Massachusetts um, was the first kind of example of this in the 1830s, where they did have schools where, you know, the, the widespread public could send their children there. Um, but it's not until the 20th century that you see us kind of embracing a little bit of that system so that now we have, you know, in independent school districts. But make no mistake, an ISD is, in a, in a sense, a form of kind of a socialized system. Now, don't mistake me. I'm not saying school districts are socialism. But I'm saying it's like a socialized system where we as a community empower an entity within our community to control education. And we all benefit, we all contribute, and we all gain access to that. Um, so it's that kind of concept. So socialism, these, these ideas, it becomes, um, and if you're thinking, whew, mind blown, um, you should, because it's very often in, um, in dialogues, especially if you're a, somebody who watches major news channels or watches the Sunday morning news shows. Um, people often simplify these concepts into very like broad paintbrush strokes. And the reality is this is much more complex than anything that you hear on the media. And so this is where being an educated, a smart person will help you understand when you watch you know, some news program and they start talking about socialism and how we don't have socialism in the United States, you as a smart person will go, well, yeah, not, not exactly, but in some kind of form, we do a little bit. Um, and understanding that helps us examine the broader scope of the issue. Um, so we've got that socialism, uh, of course, a lot of this comes from Europe, from the European immigration. Karl Marx had started his writings in the 1850s. Socialism really grabbed hold in Europe, uh, which, of course, was a little bit farther ahead in industrialization. So it was um, kind of struggling with some of these issues already. Um, and so socialism in Europe is going to be, uh, is going to kind of spread over to the U.S., now, the difference is, in the U.S., we've got this free market system that most people prefer to the socialized systems of Europe. So um, it never quite becomes more than kind of a, a minor party in the U.S. And understand that really when we talk about socialism in the U.S., as I previously pointed out, it's a whole different creature. Um, the, the socialized, the, the, the pseudo-socialized systems that we have in place here, even the socialist party as it begins to exist in the late 1800s in the U.S. is nothing like what you have in Europe. So in that case, a lot of the political pundits are absolutely correct that European socialism is a whole different monster. Um, and really in America, we don't like that kind of socialism because it's tainted with a sort of radicalism, a sort of anarchy that we're going to blow up the whole system and remake it. And this anarchy is going to kind of fuel some frustration towards um, immigrants because they're going to feel like these immigrants are trying to destroy the American system. Um, so just kind of understand that. Um, and you can see that the primary response is the Sherman Antitrust Act. 
Um, and the Sherman Antitrust Act is kind of a, a re reflection of that benevolent government management. Um, but note also that it's not really used until Teddy Roosevelt. And when it is used before Roosevelt in the 1800s, it's used primarily against uh, unions. <clears throat> Uh, emerging problems. Uh, of course, the big benefit is efficiency, right? We have an efficient system. We also have national wealth, wealth that's not just focused in the South or focused in the North, but wealth that benefits the entire country. National connections with railways, and we've got you know integrated markets. You know, consumers in the West who provide resources, and consumers in the South, and the system that you know we'd kind of seen a little little glimmers of it in the early 1800s um, but because of the southern slave system they kind of they, they kind of kept the south and the north divided you didn't have a truly integrated national market I mean you had a little bit tiny connections but after once slavery is removed it, we become one national market um, and it balances the economy to a sense in that you have that you don't have one region that's all you know, natural resources, and one region that's all factories. You begin to have a balance across the nation. Now, that takes several decades to work out. So at any given year, you might see some imbalance. But by and large, you begin to see that trend towards this large kind of entity kind of concept. Um, the costs of industrialization. Concentrated power in the hands of the wealthy um, that at its very nature is anti-democratic. Um, so think about that when you think about the, the campaign contributions and the fact that we have no limits uh, on how much campaigns can spend when they, when they, campaign, when they you know, try to get people's votes. Um, when you have you know, concentrated power in the hands of the wealthy and they have the money to buy the elections, we don't have a democratic system. And I think that's a criticism of the Gilded Age that we can certainly apply to today's politics. Um, and that's true no matter what your party is. Um, both parties are extremely tainted by this, and we should be extremely insulted at both, you know, at any politician because they're all, well, any, um, particularly national politicians, not so much local because local elections run a little bit differently. But national elections, certainly, um, I don't care what party they belong to. Um, they are going out to dinner with the Koch brothers or with, you know, some, some wealthy Hollywood guy or something like that to see how much money they can get. Um, this corrupts politics so that we can't be sure that politics are for um, everybody, that we're doing what's best for the majority of people. That, you know, and this is where that question about you know, wealth redistribution or government management comes in. Um, it's not that you want to penalize one particular group of people, but you do have to ask the broader question of how is this going to help the most. If we tax the rich a little bit more, and they still have lots of money to spend, but this allows us to increase education or improve road infrastructure, then maybe that's not a bad thing because it benefits everybody. Um, this is the real question, right? Well, corrupted politics aren't going to ask that. When, corrupt, when you have corruption in politics, what you're going to have is concentrated power that skews the political system and skews the laws and skews the decisions that come out of the center of, of politics that skews them in favor of the concentrated power. Um, oil and gas industry, uh, you know, drug companies, pharma companies, um, where they take legislation and they make sure that it benefits them at the expense of what's really good for the public as a whole. So again, this is something that we can really talk about today's politics as well as Gilded Age politics. Um, the wealth gap, extreme wealth versus extreme poverty. Um, and we have some of that too um, in the fact that you have, I think Mr. Betts quoted that we have 1920s level um, wealth inequality. I've even read some reports that say we're back to Gilded Age level where you're talking literally 1% owns like over half of the wealth of the country. Um, one of the biggest problems in 2015 is, is not only do you have a concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, but you've got wealth that's distributed among the middle class, except that hasn't changed in about 30 years. So the middle class has stagnated in its portion of the wealth. So any extra wealth that's been created since the 1980s has been gobbled up by the, those at the top of the social spectrum, at the top of the wealth curve. Um, and those of us in the middle are still using the same amount, okay? And so there's a lack of growth in that sector. 
Uh, and where we do see growth is among the poor, um, the number of people that are falling out of middle class into the poor sections. Um, and this is all, you know, this is all statistical stuff, right? I mean, if you go digging around in statistics about, you know, poverty rates and middle class income rates and stuff like this, you can back all of this up. Um, so just kind of know that we have the same, we have a similar circumstance now. Now, the difference in the Gilded Age is you had a growing middle class. Um, yes, you had a huge wealth gap with a lot of poor working people and very few extremely rich people like Carnegie and Rockefeller. But you did in the Gilded Age have a growing middle class because those people, those wealthy individuals were hiring more and more professionals to help manage their businesses. Um, and that's where we kind of can contrast the Gilded Age with today. Um, and so you kind of see that happening. Lots of boom and bust cycles. Um, and I mentioned this the other day, that they start happening with more rapidity um, because supply and demand gets out of sync. When you're producing a bunch of stuff, you have to have a constant market. And if, if the market gets tweaked at all, if you have a little, you know, if you have a bad storm in one region of the country, and so one region of the country can't buy as much stuff, then you're going to throw supply and demand out of whack. And that's going to create a backlog of supply, which is going to drive prices down, which means if you're a production company, you're going to have trouble paying your workers, which means you're going to cut wages, which can make them not be able to buy as much stuff, and it becomes a snowball effect. So all it takes is one little hiccup. So that's why we see, really since the Great Depression, there's been a lot of emphasis in the government managing things to prevent these boom and bust cycles from happening. Um, to kind of calm that system down because the realization after the Gilded Age, after the Great Depression, was that it just takes one little event to kind of trigger this snowball that can get out of hand very, very quickly. But in the Gilded Age, they didn't know this, right? All they knew was that there were boom and bust cycles. And they knew what happened in a bust cycle, that people lost jobs and people went hungry and that the wealth stayed wealthy. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. We see because of the supply and demand getting out of, out of whack, uh, we see that dropping wages become a real problem, right? And this is what I just described. You have too many products, so there's too much competition, so you have to drop your price, which means the factory lowers their wages because of falling prices. And then you have deflation, right? When prices fall, and I know this is all extremely confusing, um, inflation and deflation. Inflation means my dollar is worth more. It's inflated. It's full of, it, you know, I... I go buy milk for $4 a gallon, okay? That's an inflated price. Deflation says that the price falls, that my dollar can buy more, right? If I have a deflated dollar, I can go buy a gallon of milk for a dollar. Um, that's deflation, right? And so deflation means you can buy more. So deflation is great for the wealthy and for the middle class. Deflation helps us. Look at gas prices right now. Huge benefit to the middle class. Um, you know, I, it's really interesting to see how the gas prices are going to affect us. If you look at um, the fact that the, the gas prices going down gives the middle class more money, but what is it going to do to the oil and gas industry? And what kind of workers are they going to lay off because they can't afford to pay them anymore? And if we lay those workers off, those workers can't consume products. And if those workers can't consume products, they're going to end up on government assistance, and we're going to see other industries begin to be affected. So there's a lot of interesting, this whole question of prices, there's this ripple effect out there that <clears throat> it can be, on its surface, be good for one person but not good for another. And that gets really kind of confusing sometimes. Um, so just kind of understand that. Understand that the oil and gas prices right now um, are kind of a, a living, breathing example of this very thing. So you have deflation, but you have falling wages. So it helps the rich, it helps the middle class, it doesn't help the workers. The workers who are watching their wages fall, it doesn't matter that, that the wages that they have can buy more because they're not getting paid enough, right? So the proportion of, and in fact, if, if you have deflation, the proportion of what they can buy with the dollars that they have is often more negatively impacted. This is true with farmers as well. Um, you know, you would think, oh, it, you know, deflation is great because you have a more powerful dollar. Well, if you're somebody that's living on the bubble um, and needs extra wages, if you're a farmer that needs high prices, um, deflation is bad for you. It's going to make it harder for you to make ends meet. And I know that, that all of that sounds like I just spoke in a foreign language. Um, that's okay. That's how it's supposed to feel. 
Um, you'll feel this way next year when you're in economics. Just hang in there. One day the light bulb will go on and all the, the stuff will make sense. Um, so if you have questions about this economic cycle, please come talk to me because, again, I know that this is all very mystical. Um, the worker's world. Um, so now we get, we've get we kind of talked about the overall system and the systematic problems. For the workers themselves, these are the, the working class individuals, the ones that work in the factories and the mills and all that kind of, in the, in the industries. Um, first off, the division of labor is into intricate, rep repetitive tasks. Um, and sometimes you, you're going to have this difference between skilled work and unskilled work, where you have unskilled work where they simply push a button on a machine. Again, very repetitive, monotonous, nothing special about it. Those people are going to get paid the least amount of money. You could also have labor that is somewhat skilled that requires you to know how to do multiple different components with a certain task. Um, I, I don't, I, my, my verbiage isn't quite right, but when they make steel and they pour it into the molds and they kind of shape the molds and stuff like that, that's going to be kind of a specialized task, for instance. Um, if you're the mechanic that keeps... Um, that keeps the machinery running. That's a specialized task. Um, you know, the biggest example, you know, my ex-husband uh, is an industrial mechanic at a paper mill. Um, he has specialized knowledge that allows him to be a skilled worker, and he makes more money than I do. <laughs> okay, I have a master's degree. He has an associate's degree. But because he is skilled labor in keeping a paper machine running, he makes more money. He easily out-earns me by about $15,000 a year. So just kind of to break that down. So there's a huge difference between his job at the paper mill and, say, the guys that, um, that move the paper rolls around, that cut the papers to a specific size, because all they have to do is punch a few numbers into a computer and the machine does it for them, and then somebody gets a forklift and moves it. Those guys don't get paid near what my ex-husband does because what they do is unskilled. It's very basic. In both cases, though, you have a degree of monotony. You have a degree of repetitive tasks where there's really nothing. And, and, and their ability to say, I made this, this is mine, is very limited. Um, if you look at the situation of, you know, the putting out system or even the small factories um, like the Lowell Mills where these women could say, you know, we worked together and we made this bolt of fabric. Um, the more industrialization, the more we break down these tasks, the less likely we are to be able to claim ownership for what we made. And remember the idea of Jeffersonian uh, America, that I have a part, I have ownership in what this country is doing. So this kind of thing is, it becomes a big deal if we're talking about the American mindset. Uh, standardization with the time clock, um, working hours could vary. Um, typically, there were a minimum of 10 hours. Sometimes they were as much as 14 or 16. Sometimes that would depend. Some, some industries had busy seasons where they worked a lot of hours, and then they would have you know, slow seasons where they worked fewer hours. Um, they always worked six and seven days a week. Um, the concept of a weekend, guys, did not exist until the early 20th century. Shout out to fans of Downton Abbey. Um, famous line, um, from the, the dowager, uh, duchess, countess, whatever, um, when she says, what is a weekend, <laughs> right? Because she had no concept what that was. Um, so we see that you have uh, dangerous machines because you have huge machinery, dangerous conditions. They're not concerned about safety. They're concerned about efficiency. The government regulations that guarantee your work environment has to be safe um, did not exist then. Um, the, the biggest example that, and again, I'll go back to my, my ex-husband's paper mill. Um, they have a pulper machine that literally stray paper goes into, and it's got these massive blades, right? Well, they have all these regulations about who has access to where the pulper is. And really, the only guys that have access to the pulper are the mechanics. Well, that's because it's incredibly unsafe, and you would not want just anybody walking by the pulper machine. Um, you would need somebody that knows what's going on, and they need, you would have to know somebody's in there. Well, in the Gilded Age, they didn't pay attention to that. They didn't care. Um, it was instead um, the people that, um, the people that, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, it's instead they have, they have to have these regulations. Well, back then, they just let people walk around wherever. Um, let's see. We're going we're gonna to have... Uh, 
toxic fumes, uh, open flames, no fire escapes. One of the, the most notable is the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire um, and how that kind of affects things. Um, you're going to have company housing and company store. Um, and again, this goes back to that 1610 song I played at the very beginning. Um, a lot of these industries, when they dominated a community, what they would do is they would come in and they would say, um, okay, um, we're going to pay you in company script. And if you need food or clothes or whatever, you take your company script to the store. And if you need to exchange it for actual cash, you can at the company store. Um, and so they would do that, and, but the prices at the company store would be high. And you could buy on credit at the company store, but then the next month, as soon as your paycheck came out, they would take their share. Um, it's kind of like payday loans now, right, where they have that direct withdrawal or whatever. And so as soon as you get paid, they take their payment, and suddenly you're short, right? Um, so you've got kind of a similarity there. Um, it creates a huge cycle of debt. The prices weren't fair. The exchange rates to get cash weren't fair. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. Um, so just sort of keep that in mind. Um, other workers, you've got children. We've talked about this. Um, they get paid less. Uh, women um, often worked in feminized industries. Uh, they were paid less as well. Um, and they were actually, of course, going back to the Lowell Mills. But then even after the Lowell Mills, they formed a women's trade union league. So women, whether it, if we want to generalize uh, gender here, women have a tendency to be more cooperative. So they're certainly the... the for them, getting together to present their concerns is much more of a feminine thing. This is one of the taints that comes with unions and why people get very frustrated about unions. Um, black Americans get paid less, more menial jobs, that kind of thing. Um, most of them are in service jobs as you know, cooks, as maids, that kind of thing. Um, they do have a small but thriving middle class. Um, but again, that's very small. And that, that's the group that gets held up as, oh, see, we treat blacks fine. Um, yes, but that ignores the number of people that are used as temporary labor and that kind of thing. And you see among the black community far more women working outside the home than you do even in the, the white community. Um, because typically the, the black males, their jobs were much more vulnerable. They were more likely to get fired. So it was the women that had the steady employment because they worked in service, right? They were um, domestics. Um, and so you kind of see that different change there. Um, some pictures of child labor. Um, this picture right here, Women's Trade Union League. Uh, that's what they have with the ribbons. Notice holding the baby, emphasizing motherhood. Um, and you can see in this picture right here, these kids. Um, that's a machine with moving parts. So imagine some little kid having a, a short attention span and losing a finger. And these are kids that work in a coal mine. Um, there's some, if you Google, you know, child labor pictures, you're going to find pictures of kids with cigarettes and all kinds of stuff from back then. Um, so the American dream. We have a wealth gap, but buying power of the dollar uh, increased as efficient production lowered prices. Um, this only exacerbates the wealth gap. Um, we see that working hours over the period of the Gilded Age will begin a gradual decline. Um, a lot of that's due to the pressure of the unions, or at the very least, the pressure of um, the, the fear that unions would come into their industry makes them cut back some hours. Um, it's also kind of a general concept that you begin to see people start looking at industries and say, well, rather than make one person work 14 hours a day, why don't you get two people and have them work, you know, 10 hours a day? You're going to get more labor out of it. Um, so, and then some of this has to do with production demands and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we have this whole belief in rags to riches uh, and individualism despite wage cuts and layoffs due to the bus cycle. So that belief in rags to riches, and I have some Horatio Alger, Alger stories at home, um, some actual books from the time period that talk about these young guys leaving the farm or moving into the city, getting a factory job and working their way up very kind of Andrew Carnegie-like. Um, so all of that's still there. We've got the difference between skilled workers and unskilled workers. Um, early workers' resistance. You're going to have, before the concept of unions really catches on, you're going to have um, kind of a slowed-down pace. You're going to have 
um, you know, them celebrating holidays regardless of what the factory wants to do, where the entire factory just doesn't show up to work because what are they going to do? Fire everybody. Um, undeclared days off work the same way. Um, you're going to have times where people just say, screw this, we're tired of working so many hours, we're going to walk out. Um, you're going to tend to have people that leave jobs. Of course, all that's going to depend on what type of industry it is. Um, and so you're going to see that, that workers start talking a lot about demands for better wages and hours and working conditions, and they begin to realize that businesses are pooling their resources, so why can't workers? Why can't we start to get together and say as a group, this is what we want? Um, two types of workers, this kind of goes into the skilled and unskilled trade unions, where the skilled workers that usually paid more uh, membership into a trade union was often limited to certain people, whereas an industrial union is going to be um, both skilled and unskilled. And really, the, the industrial unions are not going to be very powerful until you get to the Great Depression, and then you'll see them kind of merge together. So really, the most successful unions are these trade unions because they have the skilled labor and the companies need them. Um, after the Civil War, um, you've got craft unions and brotherhoods. These are also kind of a way, um, the, the firefighters brotherhood, they, they typically collect money to help pay for workers' families that, um, where the dad's been killed or disabled or something like that. So you had brotherhoods for all kinds of industries, um, going back to the Gilded Age. Um, but these craft unions and brotherhoods were weak and disorganized, and they often have very specific purposes. Um, the National Labor Union, the NLU, is the first one that really unites skilled and unskilled workers to condemn low wages and, and working hours. Um, but the Depression of 1873 will cause this to collapse because suddenly everybody loses their job and people just need food to eat. Um, and so the National Labor Union kind of points to this problem of it's great to be in a union when everybody's got a job, but when nobody has a job, screw the union, I'm going to go feed my family. Um, so this is one of the things that teaches unions very early that, they, that, that their power um, is strongest when the economy is good. When the economy is weak, unions are going to be weak. Um, and we certainly saw that during the recession of 08. Um, when people were desperate for jobs and the unions were just trying to keep them from firing people uh, rather than focusing on increasing wages or maintaining pensions. Um, here is a national eight-hour uh, law, which was a big kind of political thing that people suggested a lot that the government should pass a law limiting that. So guys, eight-hour workday, you can thank the unions um, for that. Um, unions and progressives, really, not just unions. Um, Knights of Labor, led by Terrence Powderly. This is one, he tries to create one big union of skilled and unskilled workers. Um, he's fairly successful by 1886, um, and he even has a taint of socialism a little bit, where um, factories would be, you know, co-owned by the workers and all that kind of stuff. Um, but he has some interesting ideas with the eight-hour workday, banning child labor, he also argues for prohibition, that workers shouldn't be drinking. Um, and he focuses on antitrust legislation. So we, so we begin to see from the initial National Labor Union that was really just about, you know, wages and working and the workday, we begin to see that the unions begin to expand their political interests into things like prohibition and antitrust. Um, and the, the problem with the Knights of Labor is that, it, you know, Terrence Powderly was the national head. But Knights of Labor had a lot of small local kind of divisions, and the local Knights of Labor would often resort to violence and sabotage and strikes and all this kind of stuff, and they were often uh, made up of a lot more kind of anarchist-type people, and it gets a huge bad reputation. Um, and this bad reputation is capped off by the Haymarket Riot, which we'll look at in class. Um, and so the Knights of Labor will kind of die a death after the Haymarket Riot, um, but a lot of that goes back to, the, to the, the standards that they had set up where, you know, Terrence Powderly talked on the national stage, but at the local level, um, these Knights of Labor would do all kinds of crazy stunts um, that would make people go, uh, no, we're not going to support you. Um, the American Federation of Labor is by far the most successful one, and it's the one that's been around the longest, and it's still around and in, in, in a variation of itself. Um, led by Samuel Gompers, 
Um, Samuel Gompers was a big free enterprise guy. He believed in competition. He believed that, that our system was fundamentally solid. Um, he said, you know, we need to focus on better wages and better working conditions to make our workers safe, to make it so that they can earn enough money to buy the products they're making, which we'll see that kind of when we get to Henry Ford in the 1920s. Um, mostly he wanted recognition of the rights of unions to function and operate and, um, and negotiate. Um, his emphasis was on negotiation. Um, not on outright strikes, not on work stoppages, not on destroying things. Um, and so he's far more moderate. So business leaders preferred him to the Knights of Labor, certainly preferred him to other groups, um, but he still is kind of a, I don't know, still kind of a, you know, th th they're still not sure what they think about the American Federation of Labor. Um, and he's very, they keep their membership very restricted um, so they don't have a black division or a white, you know, that like, which is kind of what the Knights of Labor did. They, they allowed blacks and whites to be members. Um, so AFL has a very restricted membership. So this is part of why they succeed in that they don't become a big enough threat to be a target by the government or by the business owners. But this is part of why they don't really get as much as they would like because they're not very big and they're not very threatening. Um, we do see that they keep kind of the constant noise out there about working conditions and wages and stuff. Um, so if nothing else, we can at least argue that, that they didn't let the issue fall out of sight, um, even if they weren't able to promote any kind of significant change. Um, lovely picture of Samuel Gompers. That's an older picture. Um, limits of unions. Only 10% of industrial workers joined unions. A lot of this is due to, um, you know, ethnicity. Um, you know, the, the Italians don't want to be friends with the Irish. Uh, and so if you've got a factory where you've got Irish and Italians, they're not going to be in the same union. Uh, gender, race, um, I don't want to be in a union with women. I don't want to be, be in a union with blacks. Um, and the ability of unions to communicate. If you've got a bunch of immigrants in your factory, you know, how are you going to communicate your message if, if, you know, if, if you speak English? Will everybody truly understand? And your overall sense of nativism, the preference for the native-born uh, white Anglo-Saxon American is very powerful um, because the perception is that unions attract immigrants. Um, and so that kind of makes people a little bit less likely. And there's, you know, underneath this is the concern, well, they're going to take my, the immigrants are going to take my jobs and all that kind of stuff. Um, we also have too many workers, thanks to immigration. Uh, too many workers makes it easy to replace them. Uh, and so we have this kind of steady unemployment rate that means there's always, there's always people willing to break the strike. Um, you also have random mob violence. Um, and these are often due to local issues, whether it's food prices or a specific you know, manager at a, at a specific factory um, where workers will, will act up and they'll you know, kind of Boston Tea Party-ish. Uh, maybe have a little too much to drink or get, you know, in a meeting and get really hyped up. And then they overreact to something. Um, but this overall kind of mob violence kind of makes unions seem like they're, like they're destructive and like you can't trust them, and it kind of hurts their message. Um, you certainly see that if you think about the Ferguson riots. Um, you know, you had all that looting and stuff, and it totally destroyed the message that a lot of people that were peacefully protesting were trying to get out. Um, so it's just, you know, it's kind of that situation. Um, the big question is, does the owner have the right to protect his property? Um, and he owns the company. And so what right does the owner have over that versus what rights do the workers have? If the workers don't technically own the company and they don't technically own the product that comes out of the factory, what right do they have? Um, and yet the factory would not exist without the workers. Um, and so this is the big question. And in the Gilded Age, we see the government sides with, the, with who owns the building, right? Who owns the factory? Um, <clears throat> but we'll begin to see that <clears throat> over time this will transition into a recognition that workers should have some protections, that industrialism is here to stay, and we've got to find a way to accommodate workers um, that make them feel like they, they, have a, they have a stake in the success of our government and the success of our economy. And keep in mind, this is reminiscent of the slave issue, right? Um, you know, if you have workers that don't feel like they're bought in to the success of your company, what reason do they have to try to make your company a success? Um, 
you know, if, if you're not, if you don't feel personally attached to your employer, um, you're not going to care if you take home post-it notes. You're not going to care if you print off too many copies. You're not going to care if, you know, oh, well, gee, nobody's going to mind if, if I take, you know, food from here or something like that if it's a restaurant. Um, so just, and it was the same way with the slaves. Um, what reason did they have to work faster and harder and better? Um, so there's this balance in the system that we, we're trying to work out in the Gilded Age. Strikes and boycotts, um, they were, the strikes and the boycotts were more common than the violence. The violence got a lot of the headlines, um, but there were lots of strikes and boycotts. They were often spontaneous, they were often locally based, and they often only lasted a day or two. Um, and when there was violence that happened, it happened, it was often caused by the police or by Pinkertons or by a group that was presenting law and order, so to speak. Um, shout out to my Kent State History Day people. Um, you have a couple of these, which we'll be looking at in class, so I'm not going to go into these a whole lot. The Great Railway Strike of 1877, the Haymarket Riot of 1886. Um, here's some pictures. Haymarket Riot. I was in Chicago, drove by that spot. Uh, by 1892, you're going to have silver mines, you're going to have Carnegie Steel Mill, um, you're going to have a bunch of kind of an eruption of strikes, and those strikes are going to get busted up by company guards and hired Pinkerton detectives. The Pullman Strike of 1894 is another big one that we see, um, and again, we'll kind of spend some time in class looking over those. Um, Eugene B. Debs and the American Railway Union. Debs is a socialist, uh, an American socialist. So again, we might, you know, remember back what I said that American socialism is a different creature. Um, so just kind of think about that. Um, so Eugene B. Debs uh, kind of runs, starts running on a ticket, um, trying to present a third party option. It never gets a whole lot of traction. I think the biggest year he gets some support is 1912, and even that's kind of limited. Um, but he's around. Um, and we'll talk about him off and on, uh, 1912 election, but also in World War I because he protests the U.S. involvement in World War I and gets thrown in jail, um, which is kind of a travesty. I mean, here was a guy that so believed in the United States that he ran for president. Um, so we see the power of management. Um, employers control employment in the workplace, uh, all under the guise of protecting laissez-faire, which we know doesn't truly exist. They perceive the unions as trying to be anti-free market. Um, and when I say employers controlled the workplace, I mean, they controlled everything. What time you got there, what time you left, when you ate lunch, when you went to the bathroom, what you wore. Um, in the case of a company store, they would, they would control what products you had available to buy. If they controlled the housing around their factory, they controlled the housing. Um, I mean, sometimes the control by the, by the management was extensive. Um, I mean, you think, you know, we have to worry now about what you post on Facebook because your employer or future employer might notice it. Um, it, was, it was even more so back then. Um, management would have yellow dog contracts where they forbid workers to join unions where you could get fired if you actually joined. Lockouts where they would basically say, we're going to lock out all union workers and bring in non-union workers. Um, so like, kind of like the reverse of a strike where they like force the union to go on strike. Um, you have strike breakers um, using, you know, these individuals, these immigrants, blacks, whatever. They also used court injunctions. So they went to the court system and said, we're going to force this group of people. You have to come back to work on this day or else. Um, you know, and so the, the management was able to use all of this in addition to police, state, and federal authorities. So when we think about the strikes, think about the fact that the resources that management had in order to, to enforce their viewpoint. Um, globalized economy. Industrialization transforms the U.S. and other major countries. Um, we have, you know, as we're producing more stuff, we need more markets. So we start sending our stuff overseas, and that brings in tariff questions. This will also help drive imperialism because we need more markets. We need more raw materials. We need more shipping lanes. And, you know, oh, gee, we need to send our stuff to Australia or to uh, China. And it's kind of far to travel that way. So we need to get Hawaii so we can stop over. Um, so we'll see that those kinds of things happen. Um, this will drive the Panama Canal to shorten the distance for transportation. Um, and we're going to see global communication, the development of the underwater telegraph, um, the Suez Canal in Egypt, 
um, is going to be the first major canal that gets built, um, and it's to, to facilitate transportation between India and Europe. Uh, global finance, increasing foreign investment by Americans in Europe and Europe's, Europeans in America, so forth and so on. Um, so this whole system that we live with today began because of this. Um, and it's the industrial workers who b bear the brunt of uh, the boom and bust cycles. Um, they're the ones that struggle. The unions were far more successful in Europe um, because they were able to demand social legislation and improved work conditions. The United States is much slower to do so. Um, but I think a lot of that has to do with the difference in how government um, functions in Europe and how government functions in the United States. And this would all translate back to really the American Revolution and the development of the Constitution. That in America, we have this sense of individualism, this sense of the individual has some control and power. Um, and because of this emphasis on individualism, you don't have that in Europe because Europe was always dominated by these groups, these, you know, the peasants and the nobles. And, and so there's far more this kind of community concept uh, with their form of government. So I think that's why the unions were much more successful. Um, so this is the lecture on unions. Um, let's see. Um, it's way too long for me to just direct upload, so I've got to figure out how I'm going to put this thing out there. Um, anyways, thank you very much. Bye-bye.